going to approach life. Didn't know that the Lord would give me, would bring me to this stage in my life. And I made a promise to myself that anything that I would see positive, I would let that person or, or those persons uh, know, especially my mom. She always loved uh, uh, flowers. My dad is not the type of giving flowers, okay? So she trained us to do just that. <laughs> Good mama. Good mama. And uh, when I go back, you know, I would buy this and just make her day. When she would, they would, they would come here, right? So they just make her, makes her day, you know? Because what is the value of having a coffin with lots of flowers? What's the point? If you have something nice to say, say it now. That the person can hear it, can smell it, can see it. And this is what I'm going for. One of the things in leadership that, uh, that um, I have learned through school and through life experience, leadership empowers. If you are in leadership and you do not empower people, you're not a leader. And uh, I have to give kudos and commendation to our dear brother, Neil. He has come, he is doing so well, and I, I tell you that it's just, just beautiful what you just did. He had the whole thing to lead us out, even with the prayer request. It was good. Yeah. It was excellent. And that's what it is. God has given us talents, but he supplies the extra that we don't have. He wants just a willing heart. That's all he wants. A heart that can be molded to bring glory and honor to him. So, Ronil, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yes. Welcome again to this uh, service, Divine Worship, here in Irmo, South Carolina. We welcome you at the time that you will see this, or if you're doing it live, want to give you the assurance that God is with you, He is by your side, and we hope that you are feeling His presence in this day that He has set apart to commune with Him. So, happy Sabbath to you. Desde la ciudad de Irmo, estamos dándole la cordial bienvenida a cada uno de ustedes de habla hispana. Estamos seguros de que el Señor está a su lado y espero que ustedes sientan la presencia de Él al lado suyo. Así que este día es un día muy especial porque es el día que el Señor ha apartado para que tengamos comunión con Él. Así que tengan un feliz sábado. One of the things that, um, that I have been working on for a few weeks and I was trying to condense it to how it would come about, and I narrow it down to two weeks. So this is part one, not the same title, and next week will be part two. Do you want to know what this sermon next week, if the Lord is gracious to me, to give me life? Yeah. Decoy or the real McCoy? That's the title. That title, I have had it for about three, four, five years to develop. And I think, I think, it is very appropriate for us as a congregation here in Irma to explore what that really means. So I invite you to tune in. And if you can, you can come and visit us here at Plaza, Quail Plaza. Is it? Quail Valley Plaza. Quail Valley Plaza here in Irma, South Carolina. Let's go to the screen and uh, let's uh, read what Brother Neil did so beautifully. For the Lord God is a what? A son and what else? Yeah. All right, come on, come on, folks. The Lord God is what? A son and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. 
no good thing does he withhold from those who walk blameless. Aren't you glad for that? Lord, Lord Almighty, blessed is the one, or happy is the one who trusts in you. Oh, that should just fill us with lots of gratitude. Nothing good he withholds. Nothing. Nothing. Today's sermon is a servant of the king. And this has to do with all in one name. And I told you a few weeks ago, probably one or two weeks ago, that there are uh, situations in the Bible that we do not know the name of the protagonist, of the main character. We don't. Now, there's not need to. Whenever we do not have a name, it's because your name and my name should be in the filling the blanks. In other circumstances, we do have names. And in this case, we are given this name, Abed Melech. Have you heard, how many have heard of this so, uh, name before? Once I, this is the second time that I'm preaching on, the, on Abed Melech, different sermon. And the first time only one person knew, the entire car congregation, because it's very obscure, very obscure. It is mentioned in just two chapters, but with a powerful, powerful message. So if you follow along or you have your Bible, this is Jeremiah chapter 38, verses one through six. And I am glad that in the Western hemisphere, we don't have names like this, that are hard to pronounce. Seb, Hataya, Gedaliah, Jukal, and Pashur overheard Jeremiah speaking to the people of Jerusalem. And what was Jeremiah saying? Thus says the Lord, that anyone who stays in the city will die by war, famine, or disease. But those who surrender to the Chaldeans will at least have some reward. Then keep their own lives. The Lord has proclaimed that Jerusalem will be handed over to the army of the Babylon's king who will capture it. You remember who the king was? Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 4. When these officials heard Jeremiah's remark, they advised the king, this man is a traitor. He should be put to death. We're talking about due process. His words border on treason. They are affecting the morale of what troops we still have in the city, as well as all the rest of the people. This man does not have the best interest of these people at heart, only their downfall. Then Zedekiah, the king, said, look, do you do what you want with Jeremiah? The king will not interfere. Can you imagine that? So they took Jeremiah and threw him into a muddy cistern in the court of the guard that belonged to the king's son, Malchijah. Rather than killing him immediately, these officials lowered Jeremiah by ropes into the, this deep, dark cistern where he sank into the mud, the, the mud. Now he would be silenced. Soon he would be dead. You know, I have heard through the, my life that the Bible has so many horror stories. Well, people forget there are so many horror movies and books and people just flock to those things. This is not a pretty picture. You know why? Because this account in these six verses was not perpetrated by pagans or anti-God people. It was done by the leadership and the church members to the prophet of the living God. How could that be possible? 
How could that be possible? Is it a new thing? Does it still continue today? It is interesting, isn't it? That whenever something rubs me the wrong way, what is the tendency? What is the reaction of one or a crowd? It is to go after the messenger. You've heard that before, yeah, yeah. right? Kill the messenger. Why don't you go to the one who gave the message? No, we don't do that. It's very pervasive, sinful behavior. And this was not new because when Jesus down right down to the final entrance, what we know, the world calls it what? Palm Sunday? Ready to ride the donkey? He looked over Jerusalem and he wept. Right? Remember that? And he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who? You who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How many times? This is verse 37. This is just the first part. But the, verse 30, uh, the rest of the verse says, How many times I tried to gather what? You as the hen gathered its offsprings, but you didn't want it. At the same time, the leadership of the church at that time was having a board meeting. How about that? A board meeting. And they were not trying how to improve the service, how we could get closer to Jesus. They were plotting to kill Jesus. And they said, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe. And guess what? Our reputation is at stake. What we have right now will be gone. And then the Romans will come and take what we hold so dear, our place and our nation. But there was a fellow named Caiaphas, and he was the high priest. If we would have a system that the Catholic Church does, Catholic would have been like the Pope of that church. And he said, you know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. And if you look at the situation where we're living, we ostracize somebody. We ostracize the one who is holding the banner, who is at the forefront. This has not changed. And just like in Jesus' time that happened to him, 650 years more or less, give and take, the folks, the church, was doing the same thing to Jeremiah. And the story continues. History tells us that not long after Jesus had ascended into heaven, what happens? There was a fellow named Saul. And even though he didn't throw a stone, but he says, I stood in approval of the execution of Stephen when he was stoned. And even more, I was holding the coats, the coats of the folks that were stoning Stephen. And when we, then we fast forward through the Middle Ages, how many people, in fact, just, just within the next 50, 100 years, how the church suffered, suffered. Those that were staying true to the Lord, persecution by the church folks. Now, let's talk a, a little bit to understand. Jeremiah. Jeremiah says in chapter 1, he gives his own account. He says, the Lord told me that he knew me before I was in my mother's womb. 
and doing a little bit of research, Jeremiah was called into the prophetic ministry when he was about 20 years old. And he was set apart as my prophet to the nations. And then I said, Lord, I am too young. I can't even speak. The Lord replied, don't say I am too young for you must go whatever I say to you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, Look, I have put my words in your mouth. What are we taking from here? Folks, this world is coming to an end. When? We do not know. And do you realize that our name as a church, as a denomination, proclaims two truths? It is fascinating to know how we came about to be called Seventh-day Adventists. There was a lot of names here and there. But back then, our founders found wisdom that we should be called Seventh-day Adventists. Amen. Why? We proclaim the day that has been downtrodden, that has been despised. We're upholding that truth. We do not any we do not have a copyright because it's in your very own Bible. We are just proclaiming, and then we are proclaiming that Jesus is coming again. And he is coming for you and for me. And what is our task. What should I do? Is prepare my soul. Get things in order to meet him in peace. Because he wants to take me, he wants to take you to live with him forever. Amen. That is beautiful. When we talk about heaven, streets of gold, the gates, pearl, you name it. In fact, in fact, we just fantasize because the Bible tells us that things that he has of there have not entered into the heart or the mind of any human being. Can you imagine? So those beautiful pictures that we see is just probably it's not even the too close to how beautiful heaven must be, like the song says, how beautiful heaven must be. We love to hear those things. We love to hear that Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Oh, we like to caress ourselves. Like, I love you. You love me. I love We're all lovey, lovey. But there's more to it. Yes. Love is the foundation. But there's more that meets the eye. And that's when, that's when, when we hear when we do not hear smooth sermons, that's when we start fault finding. Hmm. Too much. That is no. People will not come. And then we go to the extent to lower the bar. Because if we lower, if we're not too, ex too strict, more people will come. Those thoughts, my brothers and my sisters, are coming from the pit of hell. God gave everything he had. Everything. He invested everything. And he went beyond that. He invested his own life to save you and to save me. So how dare I come and try to change that just to appease my sinful conscience. And this is what the church was going through with Jeremiah. You, you read that, that the whole book, 50 chapters, is, is, is a storybook. Very, 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 very uh, sad situation. He is called the weeping prophet. He's the one who wrote Lamentations. What is lament? What is lament? Any teacher? Huh? Right? Lamentation, the book of Lamentation, is written by Jeremiah. But all along, and look, look how the Lord, these are the things, God is sovereign, right? He can do whatever he wants. 
He called Jeremiah and he said, you will not get married. You will not have children. An order. So a man back in those days, no family, nothing. And he doesn't know who is going to give him the right hook or the uppercut. That was his life. But he was not a sissy. I tell you that. I'm going to use that word. Jeremiah was not a sissy. To be a Christian is not a weakling. To be a Christian, it takes fortitude. It takes stamina and it takes a backbone. Does it come on, from my own inside? No. It's God, Jesus, who lives in me. So what is the story here? The plot is that the children of Israel, the church of the living God that he had just cared so much, had gone astray, astray, astray. And then he said, look, if you do not get your act together, you will put yourselves in a predicament that I cannot intervene. And he prophesied, listen, there's so many years and then Babylon will come and conquer you and it will take you and everything is spelled out just like today we know that Jesus is coming right? Uh, right. Do you believe that? Yeah. Yeah. but we know we know that if we want to walk the streets of gold there's a price to pay Jesus said, your enemies are in your own household. And we just studied just a few weeks ago that Jesus says, I have not come to bring what? Peace. But what? Sword. Sword. The Prince of Peace cannot give us peace. But then he said, I give you a certain peace that the world does not know. And what is it? How do we get divided? Not because you love USC and Clemson. That's not what she's talking about. It's more serious than that. When you are confronted with a challenge to live for Jesus, to come closer and closer to him, to give up the things that I like to do, and so this, he says, mm, that, is, mm, that doesn't jive with me. I wish you could just. And I'm still wrestling with some of those things. There is the challenge. When you start to separate yourself in your own household, this one, that one, coming up as kids, a bunch of cousins, and if somebody would say something uh, to do, uh, you know, oh, I want to sing this, this, oh, I want to do this uh, for Sabbath school. Then the cousins would say, myself included, we would take turns. Hey, you want to be holier than thou. You know, in Spanish we said santulón. You Spanish? Yeah. Yeah. Looking back, it was, it was just a, I think with, with you know among kids but you know, came back and says look the root it was there you know instead of telling yeah 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 we'll help you no we would just pull them down the same thing happens now the king Zedekiah and his kingdom was besieged for several years and it comes down now that we have a situation, and I will just highlight some of these. What the Lord had entrusted Jeremiah, remember in chapter 1 we just saw, the Lord says, I will give you a message and you tell the people. I will be with you. Chapter 20. Chief officer in the temple. Can you imagine that? Being shot in the church. Jeremiah is captured. And is charged with disturbing the peace. And then 
he is beaten up severely and he is put in a sort of straight jacket. We go to chapter 26. He is preaching, he is giving his testimony, what the Lord has told him to, and now the priests and the prophets want to kill him as well. 36. He calls one day to his scribe, Baruch, his scribe, the secretary. I said, Baruch, I have a word from the Lord and I want you to write. So he starts to, he starts a dictation and he finish, finishes the scroll and Baruch goes to the church and he gets up there and he preaches. Chapter 36. And the people got us, what a minute. Yeah. The church officers get hold of that. Is that so? Come on, Baruch, come and read. He goes there and he reads to the leadership of the church. Baruch, how did you get this word? How how you come up with this scroll, this book? Well, the prophet told me to write it, and I wrote word by word. This must be told to the king. And they goes to they go to the king, and when the king starts to listen, the word from from whom? From whom? All right, I'm losing you folks. Word from the Lord. Everything when we come to church, we make sure that it is word from the Lord. Amen. In this case, the king, the one who should be looking out to make sure things are being right, when he starts to hear the word from the Lord that is written in that book, he takes the knife from Baruch's side and he rips it. And it was in the winter time. It was cold. So he had a fire in the palace. And he takes that and burns it. Wonderful stories. Are we doing the same thing today? Think about it. No, we might not be shredding the Bible or making a fire pit with its pages. But whenever I did something, I question something. When it is a clear, thus says the Lord, I am doing the same thing that the king did. No mistake about it. Verse 37. Jeremiah is going to his relatives in a certain town, and one of these officers catches him and says, Oh, <laughs> you're running to the Chaldeans. You're committing treason. And then he is imprisoned again. This is where Abednelech comes in. Abednelech, who was he? He was a fellow from Ethiopia, North Africa. On top of that, he was a eunuch. And I made a quite extensive research in the last two weeks, and that situation was brutal but that didn't mean that these fellas were just weaklings it is said that one of the toughest toughest group of eunuchs were the ones from ethiopia they were they were feared because they were just they were just bad boys tell you they yeah they didn't play games so from history we can infer we can take some things and, and, and come to, this is where Abedmelech was. He was from a, another continent, from another ethnicity. He had some disadvantages as any normal man. He was basically a slave himself. So is there any, is there any, excuse for me not to be a servant of the king. Can you imagine? And bet means servant of the king. If he had everything against him, and I'm gonna tell you this from my own experience, that whenever you leave your country and you become a foreigner, everything is against you. Do I have a witness? Those that are not born, US born. Everything is against you. 
When I came here, nobody would give me a job because my papers were not being transposed to the U.S. system. And I begged, begged, begged for, no, 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 you're too overqualified. No, you can't. Tough, very tough. So here is Ebedmelech. And then he hears all the plots that are putting together against the prophet Jeremiah. At this time, Jeremiah is about 60 years old or plus. He's getting up in age. Back in those days, he was old. And they hear that these fellas are putting him in that cistern. In fact, Josephus, the Jewish writer says that when they put him there, it went all the way to its neck. I have read accounts of people that have been tortured. And I'm not, I'm not going to gross you out. But I tell you what, what an individual, a human being can do to another human being outside the protection of God, it is terrible. We're not good people. In fact, Jeremiah wrote, remember that? Uh, our superintendent read it uh, last week, I believe it was, that our human heart is what? Is what? Wicked. Is wicked, right? What does it say? It is bad and desperately wicked. The only thing that is restraining me from hitting somebody here is the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit. Because he has taught me that no, it is not good to go and punch somebody and cut somebody out. Here is Abednelech. He puts everything on the line. Everything is against him. But when you know who is your father, not earthly father, when you know who you have believed in, that's Jesus, there's nothing, nothing that will hold you back. Do you do it on your own strength? No. Is the power of the Holy Spirit working in you and your willingness to be his servant? He goes and he challenges and he says, King, these men who were princes and who were big, big shots in the government and in the church, those men, and he calls them out, he says, they have done evil to Jeremiah. They're going to leave him there, and hardly there's any food because of the siege, and he will die. Zedekiah, he was not a good king. He was wishy-washy. When these fellas came and said, king, he needs to die. Okay, okay. I can't do anything. I can't do anything about you, Jeremiah. They're saying that. Now he comes and says, okay, go ahead. Get 30 men and pull him out. The beauty of this is that Abednelech, everything against. He says he gathers some ropes from behind the church pulpit platform and some old rags. And they go and they say, Jeremiah, here are the ropes, but make sure you put those rags underneath your armpits so you won't get hurt when we pull you up. You talk about, you talk about action with compassion. Action with compassion. Please put these old clothes and rags under your armpits, under the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. So what do we learn from Abednelech that is so vital for your Christian walk and my Christian walk. What is so important? We have no excuses. No excuses. We have been given everything thus far in this congregation to be a champion for the Lord, to do what he says, to go about his errands. The only thing that is stopping us is what? A willing heart. That's all. I know that some of you won't, do not like to hear this. Just like in Jeremiah's times. 
the only thing that I'm sure that um, you will not put me in a pit, because I think I can still run a little bit faster. But the same scenario is there. The same situation, folks. Yes, Jesus loves me, this I know. But there is, a, there is something to be met. There's a hurdle to go over, to clear. A bit more would have should have or could have said, hey, you know, I'm just a foreigner here, I'm just a slave, uh, you know, look at my position. But he defied. In the name of the Lord, he did the right thing when they were doing, the church was doing the wrong thing. Courage comes from trusting in the Lord. Amen. He was bold. He was bold. Abed Melech put these three things into place. Do unto others, because I have learned in my lifetime that when you see somebody talking about this person, just bang that they will be talking about you too. No questions, it's just a matter of time. Who said, if I perish, I perish? Who said that? He, Queen Esther, right? The same thing would, he went bold. With boldness, he went to talk to the king. He was at, at the gate. But he was going under the orders of the Almighty. He had courage to act on his faith. A faith in action defined by love. And re was rewarded by trusting and relying on God. How was he? How was he rewarded? This is beautiful. Chapter 39, the word came to Jeremiah, who was in prison, but not in the dungeon. He was out there uh, above ground. And the Lord says, go speak to abed Malek. You know, the Lord knows your name. You know that, right? He knows what your background is. If Jeremiah had forgotten anything, he said, the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian. Yeah, the Ethiopian. That's the one I want you to talk to. And he said, tell abed -Melech this. This is the sovereign. This is the monarch of the universe. Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for adversity and not for good. And they shall be performed in that day before you. But I will deliver you in that day. Isn't that wonderful? Can you imagine how abed -Melech felt? that the king of kings used his servant to tell him that message. But I will deliver you in that day and you shall not be given into the hands of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely deliver you and you shall not fall by the sword. But your life shall be as a price to you because you have put what? Your trust in me. The question now as we finish. How much do you trust the Lord? Like I have said before, don't answer it. Don't raise your hands, just your conscience. How much do we trust the Lord? Do we have that confidence to go against all odds, to defy the system? The time is coming, folks. The time is, is coming that each one will be tested as we were the only human beings living on earth. What will be the outcome? Will we succumb to the system? Will we just go with the crowd? We will just go with the easy flow? Remember what Jesus said, broad and well paved, no potholes in that interstate. <clears throat> interstate and many are walking through it or on it but the end is what destruction and then he says but take the narrow one oh yeah it is hard it is very hard very hard Christian walk is hard but it's not impossible it's not impossible it's not impossible because Jesus is walking by your side Lo. I am with you until the end of the 
age, right? Yes. And he says, yes, I need to go, but I will give you the paraclete, the helper, the Holy Spirit. And he will guide you to all truths, to all truths. Jeremiah and Abedmelech, they stood in the gap. This text says, Jeremiah, go about the streets of Jerusalem. If you find somebody that is executing judgment, one who is seeking the truth, I will pardon. I will just withdraw everything. But he couldn't. He couldn't. Is there anyone that will stand in this congregation for God? Among ourselves, it is easy. Sometimes we have to challenge each other. Hey, brother, say amen. Hey, nobody will say anything. But if we're afraid of saying those things here, can you imagine when we leave these doors? We're not saying it. We're not saying it. Jeremiah proclaimed a message of doom, yes, but he also proclaimed a message of hope. Because of that situation, the kingdom opposed him, beat him, isolated him, threatened him, persecuted and imprisoned him. He was lonely, rejected, and persecuted. You may lose, I may lose everything that this world has to offer if I make a bold decision to follow Jesus. It would be interesting for you to know the story behind that song, I have decided to follow Jesus. Very sad. In the northeastern corner of India, that's where he was born. Franklin David Russell says, a smooth sea never made, made what? It takes what? Rough seas, right? To become a good carpenter, you have to get some cuts. Right, and every any 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 um, um, skills that you have, you have to go through through it. But the promise is, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep you, sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Verse four: Since you are precious. And honored in my sight. That's how God sees you and sees me. That we are precious and honored in his sight. And because I love you, do not be afraid, for I am with you. Amen. As you look through history, the church, so-called church, church leaders, use the dungeon as places of torture. It is in the Bible and it is in the history books of the Middle Ages. Torture. Here's a quotation. In a dungeon crowded with felons, John Bunyan, remember who he is? The one who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress breathed the atmosphere of heaven and wrote his wonderful allegory of the pilgrim's journey from the land of destruction to the celestial city. Pilgrim's progress and grace abounding to the chief of sinners have guided many feet into the path of life. I want to tell you, I want to be perfectly clear. I am not looking to be a martyr or to be a hero for that matter. God doesn't, he's not calling us to be martyrs or heroes. He's just calling us to be his witnesses. What is that? Just tell how great things God has done in your life and in my life. That's how we're, he doesn't want dead people. He wants live people to go tell others that he is coming soon. But there is a standard to be met. Folks, if we stand on his promises, we will be more than conquerors. But we have to be willing. We have to be willing. We have to be willing to get off our mindset that is not allowing you to get to the next level. Let's stand up 
and uh, gladly and happy sing.